Hello everyone and welcome back to the good stuff. We are continuing the Morphe saga where we left it off uh, in the second game uh, of the 1858 match between Daniel Harvitz and Paul Charles Morphy. Now uh, we uh, mixed up the uh, the game order because first I showed you the first game of the match and then only then I showed you the King's Gambit game that led to the match. Uh, but I also made another blunder because the first game of the match that I've shown uh, is actually the second game of the match and only this now that I'm showing you is actually the first game of the match. It's... Uh, uh, I, uh, I I took the uh, the uh, order of the games from chessgames.com and uh, they're the number one and number two are switched. So it, I mean it's not a terrible thing that happened, but uh, it would be better if I've shown you the the first game they played first. But now that you do know this, this is actually the first game of the match, and you've already seen the second game in the previous video. So without further ado, let's check it out. As here. Uh, you've seen the the, uh, the the previous game was of a, of an insane quality and this one uh, is uh, well very similar because here Harvitz opens with d4 and this is uh, already showing that he is uh, uh, well well ahead uh, well ahead of his time regarding opening theory uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this uh, Harvitz is 36 years old at the time this game was played and Morphe is still of course 21. So d4 and Morphe replies to the queen's pawn opening with e6, uh, also known as the Horwitz defense. We have c4 and now d5. We have knight to c3 and now knight to f6 and we have transposed into the queen's gambit declined. And now bishop to f4. You've seen this move many times in modern games but... Uh, uh, maybe not all of you know that this is actually the start of the Harvitz attack uh, as this move was first played uh, by, by Daniel Harvitz here. Not, not maybe the, the first time that this move was played but from notable players. So bishop to f4 and now Morphy plays a6. Uh, very, a very safe move taking away the b5 square from white's pieces and later on he's gonna strike in the center with c5. We have e3 preparing to develop the light square bishop and Morphy immediately strikes with c5. We have knight to f3. And now knight to c6 by Morphe. We have a3 uh, and c captures on d4. We have e captures on d4 and now d captures on c4. So Morphe just trades everything. Uh, bishop captures on c4 and now b5. a6 move allows this move to be played. And now you also free up the b7 square for the bishop uh, to grab hold of this very long diagonal. And now there is one game I think from 2004 where bishop to a2 was played. Uh, but after bishop to d3 it is as of move 10 that this position has never been reached again. So Morphe continues development. We have bishop to b7 uh, and now Harvitz castles. Uh, we have bishop to e7. Morphe also prepares the castle. And now bishop to e5. It's um uh, it's a very interesting idea because uh, you, here Morphy has the opportunity to grab one of uh, one of uh, his opponent's bishops. But after this is uh, played, for example, captures and captures, uh, then this pawn uh, is is a pretty great piece. And whatever Morphy plays, knight d7, knight d5, uh, you will constantly have to worry about this diagonal and if the queen can join the attack, uh, because now these squares are not available for for the knight anymore. So it kind of weakens black structure, uh, but it is playable. Uh, Morphe instead goes for castles uh, and now queen to e2, continuing development and uh, uh, connecting rooks. The rooks can now be developed c1, d1, e1 and so on. And moves like knight to e4 can be played because then if captures and captures then the queen assumes this very nice diagonal as well. So here Morphe could continue just developing queen to b6 is always an option. He could still trade on e5, connect the rooks. Uh, but Morphe goes knight to d5 and it's... Uh, Kind of a counterintuitive move because you uh, move pieces away from the defense and you have to respect the bishop pair, you know. Uh, if you don't respect the bishop pair, bad things will happen. So here, bishop back to g3 and now Morphe plays king to h8. It's um, hard to say why king to h8 uh, because there, there currently aren't any threats. You don't have to worry about any bishop captures on h7 with check as the g5 square is covered many times. Uh, but I think Morphe was just uh, preparing to open up the g file for, for his rook. So here rook f to e1 and bishop to f6 now. Uh, we have queen to e4 taking advantage of the knight no longer occupying the f6 square. And now Morphe has only one move that doesn't uh, result in checkmate and that is g6. So the mate has been prevented. And here Harvitz goes for a, a trade. Knight captures on d5 and now Morphe has to has to trade. Uh, capturing with this pawn uh, is possible but then yeah, queen to f4 will put a lot of pressure on black's position and while it is playable Morphe prefers queen captures on d5 here. He offers a queen trade and uh, 
probably wanted to test out uh, uh, Harvitz's um, uh, endgame skills. And like I said, this is actually game one of their match. So here Harvitz accepts, queen captures on d5, e captures on d5, and now the immediate knight to e5, taking advantage of the pawn uh, being uh, uncapturable, because if you capture it, then just knight here, and you lose the rook. Well, the exchange, the bishop has to move, otherwise you're going to lose a piece, uh, and if you don't, then it's uh, uh, just bad. Uh, you, you have to play something like bishop g7, captures, captures, and then white will be up the exchange. So here, instead, after knight to e5, Morphy played rook 8 to d8, now taking away the d7 square from the white's knight, and now knight captures on c6. We have bishop captures, and here, if you look at this position, both players have uh, six pawns, both players have the bishop pair, both players have the rook pair, uh, but uh, Morphy's uh, pawns here on the queen side are all on light squares, he has a light square bishop, which makes... Uh, uh, Harvitz plan all that more, uh, uh, well, natural. Rook to c1 puts pressure on the bishop. Morphy defends it with rook to c8. And now a bishop to e5 right away can be played. But Harvitz goes for the even better bishop to d6. He first puts pressure on the rook. Uh, you can't really uh, play rook to e8 because then just rook captures and you have to, uh, well, remove one of the one of these guys and then uh, you, you just grab uh, one of the other pieces. We can even show it if you play something like rook, rook here, then just rook captures on e8 with check and it doesn't matter what uh, you recapture with. If you recapture with the bishop, then the rook falls. If you recapture with the rook, uh, then the bishop falls and you don't have to worry about any checkmates because you always have bishop to f1 after this check. It's not a problem. So instead, after bishop to d6, Morphy has to move the rook. He decides to go for rook to g8. Uh, rook to d8 is also possible. Then bishop to e7, of course, comes and white will be able to uh, get uh, the rook all the way to the 7th rank. So instead, rook to g8 and now bishop to e5. This is, the ab this is absolutely the correct plan. You have to trade off the dark square bishops because then Morphy will only be left with a light square bishop and all of his pawns are on light square. So... Uh, that's the definition of a bad bishop. So here, uh, Morphy uh, decides uh, to go for king to g7. And here, again, Loventhal takes an opportunity to scold Morphy for his decision. So Loventhal says that uh, capturing the bishop is the way to go in this position. And then uh, Harvitz couldn't really push for any advantage. And it's a very interesting and bold claim. Because uh, if you allow the engine to crunch the numbers, the, the engine says both moves are maybe of equal worth and if the engine has to pick a favorite then uh, capturing the bishop is the engine's favorite so Lomental definitely onto something but uh, in uh, nor some normal terms for humans uh, king to g7 also very playable uh, but okay uh, king to g7 by Morphy and now f4 cementing that bishop on e5 uh, we have bishop to d7, Morphy now offers a trade of rooks, and now king to f2. Uh, Harvitz starts bringing the king into the game, as this is what you should always do in an endgame. Uh, we have h6 by Morphy, and now king to e3. Uh, activating the king even further, Morphy trades a pair of rooks, we have captures and captures, and now bishop to c8. Uh, Sorry, not, not c8, rook to c8, uh, just offering uh, yet another trade. Uh, and here, rook to c5. Of course, you don't want to trade because that makes uh, uh, black's life uh, a, a lot easier. So here, rook to c5, saying to Morphy, if you want to capture, I'm going to get a very nice pass pawn here. So Morphy first grabs the bishop on e5, we have f captures on e5, and now bishop to e6. And now Morphy says, okay, this is uh, now perfectly fine for me, I don't think you have anything... Uh, uh, that you can do. Uh, but a bad bishop is a bad bishop. And while the bishop is on e6, it's it's more of a pawn than a bishop. So here, uh, Harvitz starts uh, by um, uh, challenging Morphy's queen side, and he plays a4. And okay, Morphy captures it with b captures on a4. Bishop captures on a6, and now comes rook to b8. Uh, rook to a8 maybe, maybe is a safer move, attacking the bishop and immediately defending this pawn. Uh, but okay, Morphy decides to go for rook to b8, and now rook to b5, not allowing Morphy to capture this pawn. We have rook to d8 now. If you now go here, then bishop to b7 is also very strong with a double attack on this pawn. So rook to d8, defending this pawn, and now rook to b6, making room for the bishop to, uh, to leave the a6 square. Rook to a8 now by Morphy, and only now king to d2. Uh, so the king will now help out with the defense of the of the queenside pawns with bishop to c8 offering a trade but it also means that Morphy will be down a pawn so here bishop captures uh, we have rook captures on c8 and now rook to b5 going after the pawn here 
Rook to a8 and now uh, Harvitz just grabs the d5 pawn. Rook captures and now Morphy plays a3 and he will either get a beautiful pass pawn here or ha Harvitz will have to capture. Capturing is of course best. We have captures, captures and now Rook to c5 making room for the pass pawn to be pushed forward and it's a very safe position for Harvitz. Uh, Morphy can't reach the king side pawns because if you check Harvitz just defend, uh, defends and you cannot trade Rooks because a pawn up here is uh, just, just winning for Harvitz. So uh, Morphe instead goes king to f8, starts bringing his king into the game, king to e2 now. Now any checks can be met with king f3 and the pawns get defended. King e7, we have d5 now. And look at these beautiful pawns controlling all of these squares. Uh, this is not, uh, not a pleasant position for Morphe to be in. We have king to d7 and now rook to c6, preparing rook to f6 to go after the f7 pawn. Uh, and here was probably the last good moment for Morphe to go for some sort of a perpetual here with check, king f3, check, king f4. If king f4, then rook back to a2, you go after these pawns. And it's maybe possible to play this. But Morphe started with h5 instead. Uh, just going for uh, an improved pawn structure, I, I guess. And now comes rook to f6. Going after the pawn here, Morphe says no problem, king to e7. Again, king to e8 is better here, uh, but it's uh, it's um, uh, only as means of guarding this pawn and you prevent d6 because d6 now is met with the very unpleasant rook to a5, threatening to capture with check. And after e6, you still get f captures, rook captures with check and king to f7. And now, uh, uh, now it's it's perfectly fine uh, because this move now, which uh, is incredibly dangerous, is met with rook to d5. So you don't have to worry about anything. And this is now uh, this is now just a draw. Uh, but Morphe went king to e7, and this allows Harvitz to uh, execute the pawn push with check. So here we have d6 with check, king to e8, and now. Uh, you're playing the white pieces, uh, you are Harvitz, uh, feel free to pause the video and to win the game uh, uh, against Morphe while, while I give you a couple of seconds. I know you like Morphe, but you still have to find the best move. Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on being a, a true master of the end game. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, uh, it's of course uh, e6. This uh, just crushes through the position. And now you see why that rook to a5 maneuver was so important. Because here, uh, you don't really gain anything. If, if you start checking, rook e2 check, king e3, uh, you simply allow the white king to go up the board because any captures here are just made with d7 check, king e7, and now even this. And now who, who can stop all of these queens? It's just game over. So instead, after e6, uh, Morphe played f captures on e6. Now comes rook captures on e6 with check, king f7. But now the move that we mentioned uh, actually works. d7, this is what Harvitz plays. And now there is no rook to d3 to defend against the queening. And of course, capturing the rook uh, just uh, white brings the queen into the game. So after d7, Morphe's next uh, move is forced. We have rook to a8 guarding the queening square. Uh, we have rook to d6, preparing the queen, and now rook, a king to d7, attacking the rook and guarding the queening square twice. So now Harvitz is uh, free to gobble up the king side pawns. Uh, rook captures on g6 is played, king captures on d7, and now rook g5, going after the last remaining pawn. We have rook to h8, and now comes king to f3. Uh, we have king to e6, Morphe starts uh, bringing the king closer, but now king to g3. We have h4 with check, uh, and now king to g4. And now Morphe's last attempt at a trick, h3. Uh, of course, if uh, Harvitz captures it, then this is a well-known draw. There's no way to... Uh, to win this with with the uh, uh, the the h-pawn doubled up. Uh, but here, of course, after h3, Harvitz has just played g3, and now there's nothing really for Morphy to do. He played king f6, but now rook h5, and it was in this position that Paul Morphy resigned the game, as there is nothing more to be done here. If you trade rooks, of course, uh, the pawn will be easily won, and that's just game. And if you don't, if you play something like check, uh, then the king wins the pawn, and of course, you're up two pawns. This is a completely winning end game. So uh, this is basically the first game of their match and then comes the second game of the match that you've seen where Harvitz played a really, really impressive game uh, with the black pieces. Uh, I mean, it was a, really a game of high quality. And you, as you can see here, Morphe didn't really play uh, all that ambitious, uh, but it's something that um, uh, that uh, Edge, uh, Morphe's companion on the trip, often said that Morphe didn't really uh, do all that much in the first games of the match, uh, and Morphe didn't really uh, seem like he was bothered by losing this, even though Harvitz was the most unpleasant. Uh, there is a uh, there is a, 
uh, saying that uh, uh, Harvitz, uh, after defeating Morphy, he even uh, grabbed his hand and uh, he, he kind of uh, felt his pulse and he said, uh, you know, in front of everyone that uh, Morphy's pulse uh, remains the same. It doesn't matter if he's winning or losing or uh, basically that... Uh, uh, I don't I don't know what he even wanted to say by this, but he was most unpleasant and he made a remark that it takes very uh, little trouble to beat this fellow and uh, uh, Edge was very very nervous about this Morphe was losing by two points in a match and uh, he said that he would uh, you know uh, Offer any stakes that that Harvitz chooses. So like I said uh, if Harvitz chose uh, like a million dollars Morphe Morphe would um, uh, also stake that and uh, no one was, uh, you know, everyone was angry because other people placed bets as well. And they thought, of course, everyone heard of Morphe. They thought Morphe would just uh, crush him. Uh, but uh, Morphe said to, at uh, Edge uh, when they were, you know, strolling the town, enjoying uh, Paris, that th there was nothing to worry about. And these were uh, his words. He said, uh, how astonished all these men are going to be. Uh, Harwitz will not win another game. So that's a that's a pretty bold claim. Morphy lost the the first game, but okay, he kind of threw that one to, to even get a match against Harvitz. But now he's already down by two points in the match. So will Morphy be able to uh, to support uh, his claim that Harvitz will not uh, win a single game anymore? We'll see, uh, because as you've seen, Harvitz is quite a fighter. We already mentioned how he was losing to Leventhal uh, nine to one, and then he won the match eleven to ten. So he is definitely a fighter. We'll see if Morphy can turn this around. So yeah, that's the second game of the match. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, pa pa Patrick Sibets, uh, Josef Paloka, uh, Ronald Nicht, uh, Robert Arathun, and John Wamsley for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing the Morphe saga, checking up on your wonderful suggestions, and whatever else happens in the chess world. So thank you all. I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your Sunday.